imagine the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that glorious is the one who made stellar formations in the sky and placed therein a lamp and a bright moon. And he is the one who made the day and the night following each other for the one who wishes to be mindful or wishes to show gratitude. And then he starts with the qualities, the servants of the most merciful. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I'll translate the whole thing first and then we'll go back uh, bit by bit and just and, and, and uh, kind of unpack what these qualities of the Rahman of the most merciful are. And the slaves of Ar-Rahman are those who walk on the earth humbly. And when the ignorant people speak to them, they reply peacefully. And those who pass the night prostrating and standing before their Lord. And those who say, our Lord, avert us, avert from us the punishment of Jahannam. Indeed, its punishment is a persisting affliction. Indeed, evil it is as an abode and a place to dwell in. And those who when they spend, they are neither extravagant nor miserly. And it is moderate in between the two extremes. And those who do not invoke any other God along with Allah and do not kill a person whom Allah has given sanctity, except rightfully, nor do they fornicate. And whoever does it shall face the recompense of his sin. The punishment will be doubled for him and, will, and he will remain there disdained forever except the one who repents and believes and does good deeds then Allah will change the bad deeds of such people into good ones and Allah is most forgiving most merciful and whoever repents and who does righteous deeds turns to Allah truly and those who do not witness falsehood and whoever repents and does righteous deeds turns to Allah truly and those who do not witness falsehood and when they pass by absurd things pass by with dignity. And those who when they are reminded of the verses of their Lord do not fall at them as deaf and blind ones. And those, and those who say, our Lord, give us from our spouses and our children coolness of our eyes and make us heads of the muttaqin, the God-fearing. Such people will be rewarded with the high place. Such people will be rewarded with the high place, al-ghuraf, the high places in Jannah, because they observed patience and will be received therein with prayers of their eternal life and peace, living in it, i.e. Jannah, forever. It is the best, it is best as an abode and a place to dwell in. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my Lord will not care will never care about you if you will not invoke him now since you belied the truth the punishment will be inseparable from you this is the last ayah we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his uh, protection so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are um, this the qualities of ar-rahman of the ibad ar-rahman now throughout the quran in different places allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the qualities of the believers. If you look at Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah. This is going to be surah number 23. If you look at the beginning of surah number 23, you'll see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qad aflaha al-mu'minun, that successful indeed are the, are the believers. And then Allah describes the qualities of the believers. So he names a number of qualities. And the idea for us when we listen to this and we recite these verses is, how many of these am I implementing in my life or how many of them do I aspire to implement in my life and can I get there? And so that's why these ayat are very important. Similarly, in Surah Al-Ma'arij, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the qualities again of the people who are not uh, those who are uh, failing. So in other words, these are the people, illal musalleen. And then Allah describes, except for those who are those particular in their salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then describes a series of qualities of these people who are favored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here in this surah, starting with ayah number 63, Allah describes 13 traits and habits of the people who are considered ibadul rahman. So we want to go through those. And again, we want to think about, are these describing me? And if not, how can I work to uh, become 
part of them? How can I try and inculcate these into my life? How can I try and embody these qualities and these traits? And this is a good time because Ramadan is coming up, A, and B, of course, we're in a very blessed night, and C, we're home. We're in a time when there is a musibah, there's a calamity, and there's a difficult situation on the entire ummah, and so we want to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we do that through turning back to Allah and making istighfar, but also trying to proactively improve ourselves and improve our condition and to uh, develop these traits within our own lives. So the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is Rahman, The slaves and servants of the most merciful. That's actually the first quality. That the quality that these people have, these blessed individuals who Allah promises the highest place in Jannah, is that they are slaves. Now, in our modern context, the idea of a slave is obviously something that we don't like to think about and we would never want to become. However, in the context of the, the Quran and the slavery or the servitude to Allah, it is the best and the highest status that a person can achieve. Why? Because a slave doesn't do as they wish. They don't uh, have the ability or they, they do whatever the master says. This is the essence of slavery is that they do whatever their master commands. And there's also an element of servitude in that the slave might not want to do it, might not do it willingly, but they forego or, 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 or give up their own desires because this is what the master tells them to do. Sometimes they, want, they don't want to do what the master says and nonetheless, they still oblige. And so sometimes we might not want to do or might want to do things that Allah tells us not to do or go places where Allah says not to or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do things and we might feel like I'm much more comfortable sleeping at Fajr time. And yet, the abd of Allah, the ibad rahman they are those who willingly forego their own pleasures to please their master, to do what their master commands. So this is actually the highest status that a person can attain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Tabarak alladhi, he says, Subhan alladhi asra bi abdihi. He describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorified be the one who took his servant, his servant, his slave, his abd, asra bi abdihi. He could have said bi nabiyihi, bi habibihi, bi khalilihi. He could have described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in any, with any words, but he chose bi abdihi, his servant and his slave. In al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa, that who took his slave from Masjid al Haram, from Makkah Mukarrama to uh, Bayt al Maqdis to Jerusalem. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable all of us to gather together in those Mubarak places again very soon. So Allah says, Wa'ibadur Rahman. Then He describes what, are, what do these people do? The first thing He describes is not that they are actually reading Quran all night or praying all night. Rather, he describes how they interact with society. That's the first thing he mentions. That the ibadur rahman are those who walk on the earth humbly. This is the first quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna. Now, this is important. Hawnan is with humility, but it's not with weakness. It's not with weakness. The believer, the servant of Allah, the Muslim, the Ibadur Rahman, is not somebody who looks weak. That a person is walking so meekly and so sort of out of humility that people look at them and they say, Bichara, who is this? Does that person need help? No, no, no. Uh, and it's mentioned in the tafsir that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh, once he saw a young person walking very slowly and he asked him, are you sick? Is there something wrong with you? And the person, <laughs> this is Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh, he wanted everyone to be strong. And he said, walk with, you know, with some power. Don't walk like this. The Prophet sallam, he would walk with a purpose. At the same time, no arrogance whatsoever. And if coronavirus and COVID-19 teaches us anything, it's that we have no place to be arrogant. That this microscopic thing, this virus, it's not even a living organism, that it, it has the ability to cripple the strongest of people to make the richest person bankrupt, to make entire nations and the entire world collapse. 
So who are we to say that we're strong? And Allah says, وَقُصِدْ فِي مَشْيِكْ وَغْضُدْ مِنْ صَوْتِكْ إِنَّ أَنْكَرَ الْأَصْوَاتِ لَصَوْتُ الْحَمِيرِ This is uh, in Surah Luqman, Luqman's advice to his son, that don't, don't be arrogant with the way you walk, with the way you talk, with the way you look at people. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا That our entire, our organs should have humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the first quality or, or the first description then is that they are servants of Allah. They are those يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Again, how do they interact with people? When ignorant people speak to them, they reply with salam. They reply with peace. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that they say assalamu alaikum, but rather they don't reply to ignorant people, to jahil people, to people who are mocking them or making fun of them or saying lewd or, or, or nonsensical things to them. You don't have to engage every single person that engages you. Simply, you leave them or you say salama. That you reply with peace. You don't reciprocate evil with evil. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Now, we're going to come across so many people within our families, within our lives, within people, perhaps when you go outside, when you go to the you know, uh, market or grocery store or office or whatever, that people might say certain things to us. Not every single thing, or online, frankly, right? Not everything requires a, a response. Not everything requires a response. And that response can simply be, Salama. That peace be with you, I'm leaving, right? It sh and, and the salam here, as the hadith mentioned, is that they keep composed and calm in response to uh, the people's insults and the people's negative talks or the ignorant people when they address them. So, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سلاما. Now, this was how people interact with society. How you walk, how you carry yourself, how people look at you and perceive you, and how you interact with people in the face of adversity or in the face of challenge or in the face of ridicule. Now, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the connection you should have with Allah. That you can't be, and this is really important, those of us that do any type of da'wah work, those of us that do any type of interfaith work, right? any type of community engagement, activism, service, there needs to be two components to that. There's the outward work that we do, that we put forward, that we try and assist people. And there's an internal light and there's an internal connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, go out and do da'wah in the day and in the nighttime you worship Allah. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'andhir that stand and, and warn people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment. Then in the other surah, Ya ayuhal muzzammil qumil layla illa qalila. That stand in the night and worship your Lord, except for a little bit. Spend your night in the worship of Allah. Here, وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا That they are those who pass the night prostrating and standing before their Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allow us to be people who worship him in the daytime and in the nighttime. Why is the night specifically mentioned here? Why is the night mentioned? There's a couple of reasons the Mufassirun, the scholars of Tafsir, they mention that the night is specifically mentioned because A, it's harder to pray at night. Right? Everybody's sleeping, relaxing, taking it easy. People are, uh, you know, most people are sleeping. Some people are having fun. Some people are just, you know, engaged in other stuff. Praying at night requires an extra level of devotion, an extra level of commitment. And secondly, it is something that, especially nowadays, is, uh, and with Ramadan coming up, this is really important, is that a person who prays at night when other people are sleeping, this is something that is sincere. There's no riya, there's no show off, there's no hypocrisy in that action. Because nobody's there to see you. Nobody's there to say shabash. Nobody's there to say mashallah. Nobody's there at the masjid to congratulate you or to look at you or to think positively of you. Frankly, nobody has any idea except you and Allah. Nobody has any idea except you and Allah. So this is a true sign of, of dedication. And this is a sign of sincerity if a person can spend their night prostrating before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the reasons why, as I said uh, in every 
every one of these classes or discussions, the most common question is, how are we going to pray Taraweeh? How are we going to do Taraweeh? How are we going to do Taraweeh? The reality is this year, it's an opportunity for us to develop an individual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a family connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that we have probably never done before. And it's going to be a challenge, absolutely. But the reward of that sincere action that we do only for Allah's sake, even if we don't know a lot of Qur'an, even if we're not good at reciting Qur'an, even if we don't have a great voice and we just repeat the small surahs that we know, right? That that sincere effort that we make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perhaps it's much better than praying, you know, the whole Qur'an behind somebody else. And so this is a chance to demonstrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our sincerity. And of course, we all beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to gather as a community in the very near future and again and again. Something, as I said last week, that we'll hopefully never take for granted again, which is the barakah, the blessing the, of just being able to go to the masjid and pray together and to embrace one another and to say salam to one another. So, That they spend their nights in sajda and qiyam, in prostration and standing before their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, this is also one of the virtues of the masjid that we're not able to take advantage of now. That the person who prays Isha in jama'ah, right? If we miss the masjid, then we should make our intention that when I get the chance to go again, Ya Allah, I'm going to go. The person who prays Isha in jama'ah at the masjid gets half the night of reward. The person who prays Fajr in the masjid, jama'ah, gets the other half of the night in reward. That's all you got to do to get the whole night of reward. But we can't do it now. Now is not the time for that. So we should have that intention that, oh Allah, if you allow me, I will do it. And oh Allah, I'm doing jamaat in my house, so give me that same reward. And at a minimum, if we can pray a couple of rakat, that would be wonderful. Again, prepping ourselves for tawih and for Ramadan. The next quality is a dua, a beautiful dua. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّ نَصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا That they are those who say, Our Lord, avert from us the punishment of Jahannam. Indeed, its punishment is a persisting affliction. Indeed, evil it is as an abode and a place to dwell in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these are people who are uh, fearing Jahannam and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them from Jahannam. Allah, we make this dua. رَبَّنَا صْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّم That, O oh Allah, avert from us, save us from the punishment of, of Jahannam. إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامَ That it's a punishment that is a persisting affliction. That it is continuous and permanent. That there is Luzum, that it is continuous. And so this is a punishment not like a moment or a small pain, but this is a punishment that is ongoing. And it's, a, it's something that will be forever for the disbeliever. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his protection. Now, if that's the framework that a person has, that they're asking for protection from Jahannam, it's one thing to ask. But if you're constantly in a state of consciousness and asking, then that also means that you're going to cultivate or you're going to uh, develop your behavior in such a way that it's impacted or it's motivated by a desire to avoid Jahannam. Meaning, I'm not going to do those things that would lead a person to Jahannam. So this is very important that the person makes dua. And again, as you said at the beginning, the idea of going through these qualities and characteristics is how many of them are, am I doing? How many of them am I uh, do I have in my life or can I develop in my life? So we should make this dua. رَبَّنَا صْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا That, that they are those who when they spend, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا they are neither extravagant nor miserly. SubhanAllah, Allah is teaching us financial ethics. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us Islam really is a comprehensive way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they are neither lam yusrifu, that they don't waste, they're not extravagant, they're not people who are spending wealth that they don't for things they don't need, 
and 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 another thing that obviously is very present in modern society is you know borrowing money to spend uh, when you didn't have the money in the first place. So you know the Islamic financial ethics te teach us to the extent that we can be debt free. We should try to aspire to become debt free. Don't borrow money to buy things that we don't need in the first place. So lam yusrifu that they're not extravagant. They don't waste their money. And one of the, 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 the commentators mentions that Islam is crossing a limit. This does not mean you can't have nice things. This is always a challenge. Is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses a person, does that mean you can't have nice things? No, that's not what it necessarily means. But you shouldn't be extravagant and you shouldn't be wasteful and you shouldn't spend on something that is prohibited in the first place. Even a little bit of spending on something that is haram is still israf. So it's not like I can have a little bit of something that is impermissible in the first place. If it's impermissible in the first place, even a little bit is wrong. Here, Allah is talking about legitimate spending. That, take for example, today uh, or in this COVID-19 pandemic, people who are hoarding, they're going to the store and they're just buying up all kinds of supplies and also things that they don't even need just because it's there. So I'm just going to go ahead and get it. Maybe, maybe I might need this type of thing or it's better to have, you know, <laughs> the whole toilet paper thing or whatever the case may be. Don't get things you don't need and don't hoard stuff and don't buy unnecessarily. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that lam yusrifu. Now the opposite is also not a quality of a believer. Walam yakturu. They're not miserly. That this is with respect to legitimate spending on your family. You shouldn't deprive your family. You shouldn't deprive yourself and your family of things. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you bounties, we shouldn't be people who are stingy when it comes to spending on those things that are legitimate. Right? This isn't, this isn't necessarily uh, that a believer should not be tight-fisted when they're directed to spend. That spending on your family is sadaqah. That that's an easy sadaqah to spend on your family, to feed your family. These are acts of sadaqah. Obviously, giving in charity, that's of course something that we should be uh, open-handed and try and give as much as we can. But even when it comes to personal spending and spending on our family, we should not be people who are uh, stingy, nor should we be people who are extravagant and wasteful. <laughs> They're right in the middle, the Quran teaches us. SubhanAllah. And one of the hadith of the Prophet is that uh, that moderation in spending is half of your sustenance. Just be moderate. Be in the middle ground of what is, what is respectable and what is necessary. That is uh, a, a half of a person's sustenance. And we can see this, that in times that are good, when borrowing is, is something that everybody is doing, and it's easy to borrow, and you can make a lot of money by borrowing some money. It makes a lot of sense from a financial perspective, not from a, from a spiritual perspective, to borrow. But then what happens is in a crisis, even you know, any economist will tell you that in a crisis, the people that are the most leveraged, that have the most debt, are going to suffer the most. The people that, don't have, that aren't leveraged, that haven't borrowed money, that don't have a worry about, or, uh, about defaulting on their loans, aren't going to be as stressed in a recession. And so this is a Quranic teaching as well, something that we should try and develop uh, in our life. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now these are things that these people were supposed to be doing. Now Allah describes things that a, abd, that a servant of the most merciful should not be doing. They are those who do not invoke any other God along with Allah. So the first six things we talked about that the Quran describes our acts of obedience. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about things that a person should not be doing. And the first and foremost of those is shirk. Now, alhamdulillah, all of us that are on this call and all of us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessed with iman, we're not actively committing shirk, alhamdulillah. And inshallah, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and keep us and allow us to die on iman. So there is the literal shirk of worshiping an idol or associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the big shirk. There's also small shirk, which is showing off, 
doing things for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So both of these, large shirk and small shirk, we should be thinking about and we should be trying to develop sincerity in our actions and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La sharika la. Similarly, if we have true uh, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't associate any partners with Allah, then we're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This goes back to we take all the means that we can when it comes to protection of our family and protection, uh, say, against this virus. We take all the means we can, but we also have as part of our means dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also have istighfar as a modality of protection, just like we take our physical precautions. We also have full reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask and beg of him to protect us and to help us. What else? وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ That they don't kill a person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given sanctity. That we shouldn't be people who... These are grave sins. These are major, major sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing murder. Uh, that, of course, that is one of the greatest sins. That it says, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا Allah describes so many punishments for the person who deliberately kills a uh, believer that that person would be in hellfire for, uh, for eternity and that person would have the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his curse. Allah describes so many different punishments and that's for uh, killing a believer unjustly but even any human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, he doesn't specify believer, لا يقتلون النفس, that whosoever kills a person, Muslim, non-Muslim, doesn't matter, that life is sanctified. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not, uh, makes extremely clear that a person should come nowhere near uh, and shouldn't help or facilitate in any way the killing of any human being. Even animals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow us to take the life of an animal uh, without the actual proper slaughter process. It's not something that a person can just uh, do, you know, for no reason. So, And that person doesn't commit zina, doesn't commit adultery and fornication. Again, the literal fornication, adultery, zina, and also those things that lead to zina, or the zina, of a person's eyes, a person who is uh, not necessarily physically engaged in the act, but is furthering or is leading themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala taqrabu zina. Don't even go close to it. So all of the things that are sinful and all of those things that are uh, sinful as, as components of the major sin or as things that lead to that path, all of those need to be avoided. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says that for these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that وَمَن يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا That whoever does it shall face the recompense of his sin. The punishment will be doubled for him and he will remain there disdained forever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the people who commit these sins, adultery, homicide, that Allah is saying the punishment will be doubled on him. Now this is interesting because our, our belief is that sins don't get multiplied in punishment, but good deeds get multiplied times 10. And so the commentary mentions here that this would be for those who aren't Muslim because a believer who commits a sin gets the punishment of that sin and then they do a good deed, they get 10 times the good deed. And similarly, when Allah says they're going to be perpetually punished, that doesn't apply to a Muslim. That applies to somebody who is not a Muslim because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that a believer will ultimately go to Jannah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us Jannah bi ghayri hisab without any accountability, without any hisab. It's uh, one of the scholars I mentioned, it's kind of like going through an audit. Nobody wants to go through an IRS audit. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, you're just worried that they're going to find something. 
Nobody says, oh, I'm, I'm, I want to go before an audit. And what is that? That's just an, uh, an IRS audit looking at some agent looking at your taxes. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks through our books from day one till the day of our death, every single thing, ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد, every statement that we utter, then how can we be, uh, how can we have that accountability? We ask Allah to grant us jannah بغير حساب, without any hisab. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that as for وَمَنْ إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ That whosoever believes إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ Who repents and makes tawbah وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا And then does good deeds. This is amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say their sins are forgiven. He says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ That Allah will change and replace his or her bad deeds with good deeds. SubhanAllah. Person committed, you know, all kinds of sins. They come on the Day of Judgment with mountains and mountains of good deeds. And they'll say, I didn't even do any of this, Ya Allah. But they had this tawbah. Allah replaced all of their bad deeds with good deeds. This is why we can never look at someone. We don't know our end result. We don't know our end result. We have no guarantee that a person will die in a condition that is good. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, make us uh, die in the state of iman and Islam, submitting to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. But somebody could be outwardly terrible, not doing anything right. And yet they have a repentance and all of their bad deeds are replaced with good deeds far superseding or, or you know, surpassing anything that we accomplished or were blessed to be able to do in our life. So never, ever, ever look down upon anybody. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the next verse, which is very similar. That whosoever repents and does righteous deeds, he turns to Allah truly. Now, what's the difference between the two verses? The tafsir mentions that there is a, in the second verse, there, there's a couple explanations. That in the second verse, it doesn't say those who believe, meaning that these people are already believers. These people are already believers, people who just made mistakes. They made mistakes and they repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, the Prophet sallallahu he tells us to make, that he used to make istighfar at least 70 times a day. The Prophet sallallahu didn't make any sins. When we finish our salah, we say astaghfirullah. The first thing you do, you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You say astaghfirullah. That's not, oh Allah, forgive me for the sins I just committed. But oh Allah, it's the deficiency in the good deeds that I'm doing. That, oh Allah, Allah says, Tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha. Make a true repentance to Allah. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking that whosoever repents and does good deeds, that that is a true repentance. He truly repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a Muslim makes a mistake, we all make mistakes. The Prophet says, Kullu bani adam khatta'un. Every son of Adam is a sinner. وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ And the best of the sinners are those who repent. So every time we make a mistake, just say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, help me to not do this again. Just a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make an intent not to do it again. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the sin and hopefully also replace the sin with good deeds. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful. Now, the tenth characteristic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ zur Those who do not witness falsehood. Those that don't give a false testimony. Now, this can happen in a number of different ways. For example, the most literal is, you know, you're subpoenaed to go to court. You're asked, did you see this? You saw it. You say no. That's a lie. That's قول zur That is false testimony. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that the Ibad rahman are not people who bear false witness. They are not people who witness falsehood. La yashhadun azur. But that's not the only scenario. If you think about, again, to make a practical current example, the government is offering uh, different types of assistance programs. And many of those are going to be based on self-reporting. So a person who fills out an application and lies on that application and at the bottom of the application signs the application and says, I promise this is the truth, that's false testimony. Why? In order to get a little bit extra money, right? If a person lies on their tax returns, if a person cheats to you know, get ahead or, or you know, false bills in a, in a medical practice or in a law practice or in 
a business or you know, uh, doesn't give the customer the right amount of product. Whatever the case may be, all of these are forms of lying and cheating that we should be very careful not to testify to anything that is false. I'm telling you A and the reality is B. And I know it's B, that that is Qawl al-Zur. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us, one of the last things he did is warned about Qawl al-Zur, about false testimony. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ Then he says, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامَ when they passed by, when they pass by absurd or vain things, they pass by with dignity. Now, in our life, we're always going to come across things that are inappropriate, and we should just continue along. We shouldn't, again, participate, A, and B, we shouldn't necessarily engage uh, in that thing. Just, just go about your business. That don't participate, and just keep moving from uh, in a dignified manner, kiraman, with honor and dignity. That's the quality of a believer and the, the servant of the most merciful. Number 12. Are those who, when they are reminded of the verses of their Lord, they don't fall at them as deaf and blind ones. Meaning, when literally the verses of Allah are recited, we shouldn't be people who just hear it, but it has no impact on us whatsoever. A person who's deaf, you can say something to them, they're not going to understand what you're saying. It's falling on deaf ears as the saying goes. A person who's blind, you can show them something, they're not going to be able to see it, it doesn't matter. So we shouldn't be people who, when we're reminded of the verses of Allah, literally the ayat of Allah could mean the verses, the Quranic verses, or the signs of Allah in the universe around us. Look at COVID and how many people haven't changed their behavior in any way whatsoever other than perhaps wearing a mask and keeping social distancing. That shouldn't be the believer. That this is not something that you can approach strictly and exclusively from a scientific perspective. That this is a virus and it's a mutation and it came from this and it's going to impact us. And you know, if we follow these protocols, then we'll be fine. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a warning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a wake-up call. And we have to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We shouldn't be people who are summam wa umyana, as deaf and blind. Then the 13th characteristic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Walla, beautiful dua, memorize this dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yaqulu, and there are those who say, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama that they are those people who make this prayer. They pray to Allah. Oh Allah, give us from our spouses and our children the coolness of our eyes, the comfort and coolness of our eyes. And make us an imam for the God-fearing, for the people of taqwa. Now, a couple points here that are really important. One is that this is prophetic and important for us to make dua for our family. You look through the Quran, you see, Rabbi habli min as-salihin wa aslih li fi dhurriyati Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyati Again and again, the prophets make dua for their families. The prophets make duas for their families and the dua of a parent for a child is mustajab. It's accepted. So we should make dua for our spouses. We should make dua for our children. We should make dua for our parents, uh, our families, this is very important that we make dua for one another. And what is qurrata a'yun? That the coolness of our eyes is going to be that when we see them, we get happy. Not just because they're, they're excelling in sports or in business or in school. Sure, every parent's going to be happy when they see their child succeeding. But more so, and also that they are excelling religiously because the biggest tragedy would be that we facilitate for our children all kinds of worldly pursuits and all kinds of uh, you know, academic and extracurricular accomplishments, but we forget about trying to raise them as good Muslims. That when we see them and we see them worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it makes our eyes happy, it makes our hearts happy. Qurrata a'yun. This is what qurrata a'yun is, is that they, you are pleased to look at them. And also it implies that there's some, 
some permanence to this, that they don't do one good deed, but that they're constantly doing things that make you happy, which means that a person who is worried about this is going to want them to be doing things that bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Allah says, and make me an imam. Now normally, we shouldn't aspire to positions of leadership, but this is an exception. That when your desire is to be a leader by which other people draw positive inspiration, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. That we shouldn't be like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm just going to be you know, in the back quietly. No, if you can inspire somebody else to do good, then that's amazing because you're going to get the reward of every good thing they do. So this should be our desire that we want to be able to help and facilitate, be a means by which righteous people can get and, and do good deeds. And also what's beautiful about this is that within the family unit, we're all going to be imams of our families. We're, we can be leaders of our family. So in, in other words, oh Allah, make my family people of taqwa and make me the imam of my family. Beautiful uh, way to think about the explanation of this ayah. And of course, as we said, literally as well as Ramadan is coming, that for the fathers, that this is a chance to be the actual imam of your family in ways that perhaps we have not had the opportunity or the chance uh, to do before. Now, those are the 13 signs. To close, Allah says, and we'll take a couple minutes with questions. That those are the people they're going to get Al-Ghurfa. These are the lofts of Jannah. So think about, you know, the houses on Camelback or the houses at the top of the mountain. They're always worth the, the, the most. They have the best views. That's Jannah. Not just in Jannah, but within Jannah, there are uh, the Rajat and the Ghuraf are the highest places in Jannah. Literal meaning of Ghuraf is the upper story, like the penthouse of Jannah, subhanAllah. bima <laughs> sabaru because of the patience that they had. These things are not easy. I'm saying that they require patience. That, that because of that, they're going to get these lofts, these mentions, these upper stories, these penthouses in Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that uh, status. وَيُلَقُونَ فِيهَا تَحِيَّةً وَسَلَامًا They will be received therein with prayers of eternal life. Right? Today miss the embrace, we miss the salam. In Jannah, it's the salam of the angels and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then a, a scary verse at the very end, Allah says, قُلْ مَا يَعْبِكُمْ رَبِّي دُعَاءُكُمْ That my Lord will never care about you if you do not invoke him. Meaning if we don't make an effort to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to turn to us. So this is a, a, a danger, like a scary verse to wake us up, that if you want Allah to address you, اُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call on me, I will answer your prayer. Remember me, I will remember you. We have to make the first step. We have to take the effort and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there. And if we turn away, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will similarly leave us and not be by our side because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us and gives us the opportunity to do so and to take those steps towards subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us ibadur rahman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, on this blessed night, blessed night, to forgive each and every one of us and to give us the ability to forgive anybody who has wronged us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, protect our families from this virus. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate it and to raise this calamity from the entire ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us in this night, month of Sha'ban and in this blessed night to make our actions and our deeds of the year to come blessed and make us among those who are drawing closer to him. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to see the month of Ramadan and to benefit from that month and to make it a means of attaining forgiveness and freedom and emancipation from the hellfire and entry into Jannah. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. If there are any questions, we can take them now either by raising your hand or through the uh, chat function. Dr. Sadia, can you unmute people? I'm not, I'm on my phone. I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, I see one hand up. Uh, Brother Sahib, can you please um, unmute uh, Sister Zarka?
Okay, go ahead and ask the question you are muted. You can go ahead and ask the question. Uh, in the meantime, let's see. So uh, there was questions about fasting tomorrow and middle of Sharban. So as we said, there are opinions. Uh, people will take uh, polarizing views of the night that it is uh, to various extremes, but the proof uh, and the, there are certainly a hadith of the Prophet wasallam that mention the virtue of this night as a very special night. There are no particular actions that are recommended to do other than general increase in worship. And there is a hadith of the Prophet wasallam that Allah forgives everybody on this night, every believer on this night, except the one who has a grudge and is holding malice and ill will towards somebody else. So this is a night to forgive one another in the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. This is very important. Spend the night in worship. It's a night in which du'as uh, are mentioned to be accepted. So we make du'a. This is the time to make du'a for, uh, again, alleviating uh, this musibah, this calamity, this adab from the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ for protection. All kinds of du'as. Individual du'as. You can ask them in English. You can ask them in Urdu. You can ask them in Arabic, Spanish. doesn't matter. If you have a book of du'as, you can go through that book and ask the, the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ. But this isn't a night, not that we can do it anyways, in which you know, you're supposed to gather in the masjid and pray all night together. That's not something that is supposed to be done, um, nor is it possible anyways. But do spend the night in worship, do extra worship. And then in terms of fasting tomorrow, there, tomorrow is Thursday. So it's a day to fast. Uh, Mondays and Thursdays, the Prophet ﷺ would fast. The month of Sha'ban, the Prophet ﷺ would fast. The middle days of the month, the Prophet ﷺ would fast, 13, 14, 15. So there's many, many reasons why we should uh, fast tomorrow. And again, we can compile those intentions and say, oh Allah, that I'm fasting. So oh Allah, through this fast, please also have mercy on the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ and save us from this punishment. Uh, so this is uh, many, many reasons why we should fast tomorrow. Other questions or um, anything else? Give another second. If nothing else, then we'll close, inshallah. Uh, There's a question in the Q&A box. Let's see. Box. If you can read it. Um, any plans to increase the webinar events during Ramadan? So I don't know if that's for um, the masjid or for you. <laughs> uh, but we are planning we'll, we'll to have more. <laughs> more virtual event. I mean, from the masjid side, we are inshallah working on a program to um, offer more of these halakas and um, virtual events in the month of Ramadan. But I don't know if you're also going to be offering more things. Inshallah, we'll try. All right. Anything else? Another minute or so? in the chat is there okay all right so we'll close with that inshallah uh, uh as we said make dua for each other make dua for me make dua for your families make dua for the ummah uh, on this blessed night and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this gathering a means of accept or accept this gathering and make it a means of forgiveness for each and every one of us and our families and the entire ummah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam subhanak allahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته